We could, we could conjure up a few more here this morning. You say, I ain't never been to a church like this. Well, I'm, I'm sorry for you. It's, that's a handicap to you. It really is. I'm sorry you've been cheated in life. And now you ought to thank the Lord that you've been allowed to be here. And find one more like, like it more often. Somebody else got a word on your heart right quick. Amen, brother. Amen. 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 Amen, brother. Amen, brother. Amen. I appreciate that testimony. Amen. That was a blessing, brother. Anybody else? Okay, take your Bibles this morning. We want to look in uh, the book of Psalms, chapter 127. Book of Psalms, chapter 127. Psalm 127, verse 1. Now, I, I preach on stuff like I'm going to preach on this morning once in a while. did a year and a half ago, almost two years ago, even here at this church. Just one of those things that you need to hear if you're like me, like most people, um, about once every month. And I'm going to be talking to the uh, married couples this morning, husbands and wives, a little bit about what the Bible says to us. And uh, how many of you in here are married? Raise your hand. You better raise your hand, some of you. Okay. Uh, how many of you in here are not married? Raise your hand. Okay. About half and half, I guess. How many of you hope to be soon? <laughs> oh, <laughs> look out there now. How many of you wish you... No, I better not say that. Psalm 127, look at verse 1. Psalm 127 and verse 1. I ever married couple here this morning, those that are husband and wife, ought to, ought to read this chapter here and pay close attention to it. Except the Lord build a house, they labor in vain that build it. It's impossible to have the home God wants you to have unless He, he does the building. Except the Lord keep the city, the watchman waketh but in vain. It is vain for you to rise up early, to sit up late. That means worry all the time. To eat the bread of sorrow, for he giveth, so he giveth his beloved sleep. Lo, children are an heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is his reward. As arrows are in the hand of a mighty man, so are children of the youth. Happy is the man that hath his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed, but they shall speak with the enemies in the gate. I want to preach to you this morning on the subject, Nine Ingredients for a Happy Home. Let's bow our heads while we pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank You, Lord, for all that You've done for us. Thank You, Lord, for the privilege of coming back to church this morning. Thank You, Lord, for what You've done for us. You have done great things for us, whereof we are glad. We thank You this morning for the good Sunday school. Lord, for the teaching that we heard and for the fellowship we've enjoyed. We thank You this morning, Lord, for the Bible, the Word of God. We thank You for the church of Jesus Christ. We're glad to be a part of Your body. Help us to be a good representation of the Lord in our homes, in our churches, on our jobs, wherever it may be. Dear God, I pray for that home this morning that may be struggling. Maybe that's on the rocks. Maybe that one that's beginning to drift apart. Those husbands and wives, God, that may be letting the devil work in their lives. I pray in Jesus' name, Lord, that you may move in their hearts this morning and fix it all up for the glory of God. In Jesus' name we pray and for Jesus' sake, amen. I want to talk to you this morning on nine ingredients for a happy home. 
You know, when you really get right down to it, the brass tax, the bottom line, you know what most people in the world really want? They want to be happy. If, if you see people, movie stars and, and singers and musicians, and people that are famous and politicians and all. Really, what people want down deep inside their heart is to be a happy person. You know what teenagers really want this morning? And you know why they do a lot of things they do? They want to be happy. And they think, if I do that, then I will be happy. I've heard people that wound up getting a divorce. And I talked to them and I say, where's your wife at? He said, well, uh, hadn't you heard we got a divorce and this happened and all? And, and he'll say, preacher... I tried every way in the world to make that woman happy. You see, what he was really saying was, I tried to make her happy, but in her estimation or his estimation, I just couldn't do it. Now, listen, friends. I've heard people say that and heard people say that and heard people say that. And I've kind of watched and looked around and wondered and, and prayed and read the Bible. And I've kind of looked and I've observed a few things. And I've found out that anybody in this world can be happy. Happiness is available to anybody in this world, but you got to know where to find it, and you got to know how to uh, keep it once you get it. Everybody in this world can be happy with that husband you married, and every man can be happy with that wife that you married if you'll do what God told you to do. I know that I, I probably, I'd probably embarrass a bunch of people here this morning if I said that everybody in here that had ever looked at your mate and secretly prayed that God would kill them, or that they would die, or maybe get some kind of poison or something, and maybe wish, and you look at them and you say, I wish I'd have never seen them in my lifetime. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand, but about I, well, I don't want to have there be blood and guts all over this floor if I did that. But I tell you what, I'd say the majority of the people in this room have thoughts like that have run through your mind. Don't you look at me like I've ever thought anything like that. Uh, brother, I tell you, uh, you probably have, but I ain't lately. And I'm telling you this morning, brother, if you... That, that's not true. That's not true. Lord won't let me get away with it. Don't worry. But I'm telling you, I'm telling you this morning, you can be happy with that person you married if you'll do what God tells you to do. You say, oh, I messed around and married the wrong one. I'm not too sure about that. I, I, I kind of don't know about this philosophy that God's got one in the world picked out for you. And if you don't find that one, you're going to be miserable the rest of your life. I don't read that in the Bible. You know what God does? He said, He that findeth a wife findeth a good thing. There's some things God kind of leads up to you. And whichever way you go, He'll bless it. And as long as you try to do the right thing, He'll bless it more. The more you do the right thing, the more you do. God don't necessarily plan out every detail of your life and you have to follow that thing. He leaves some of it open and then He'll bless you whichever way you go. I know probably some of you ain't never heard that, but the devil will tell you half of your married life, the reason you ain't happy is because you married the wrong one. You might as well get that out of your head because it's done over with now. And you just well make the best out of it. And if he can keep you thinking that, you'll be miserable all of your life. And brother, you, you can't listen to that kind of talk from the devil. You've got to get it straight from him, uh, straight from God, and you'll get it right. Now, I don't know how to bake cakes. Some of you do. I thank the Lord for it. I got two big cakes yesterday. And uh, I, I piled, and ain't no telling what all they had down there. And I know that somebody in here knows how to bake cakes. Somebody in here knows how to bake good cakes. But I don't know how to bake cakes. I fix hamburgers. That's my specialty. I can cook them things, brother, and they're good. And I, I, I can grill stuff like that. But as far as baking a cake, I can't do it. But now, what if my wife was to come over to you and one of you ladies made a cake? And she said, I wish you'd tell me how to make that. That's the best cake I ever, ever ate in my life. Give me your recipe. Give me your ingredients. You've got to have the right ingredients for the cake to turn out right. Amen? All right. She says the first thing you do, you get your two eggs and you beat them up, you know, beat them, beat them, beat them, beat them. And then you put some vanilla flavoring and sugar or whatever you put in them. And you put this and that, a little pinch of this, a little pinch of that, and cake mix and beat it around there and put it in an electric mixer. And then you fix your icing and then you turn the oven to 400, 300, whatever it's supposed to be on. Put it in there and leave it for 30 minutes and put it in there. And the next thing you know, after about 20 minutes, uh, ever what it takes, I must be getting this off a bad wrong. The way y'all are looking. But I tell you, men just sitting there like this, the women's going. 
And I'll tell you, uh, anyway, or whatever, smart Alec, you're supposed to do to it. You put it in there, and you put that thing in there, and you get it out. Now, that cake turns out the way you want it to turn out. Now, what if my wife come home and she said, I'm going to make one of them things. It's a red velvet cake. So that's uh, one of my favorite kind, second to chocolate. And brother, she said, I'm going to make a red velvet cake. And she puts that thing in there and she decides that she won't put those same ingredients that so-and-so told her. She said, that's just her opinion. That's, that's my opinion just gives her opinion. I believe if I'm sincere and I really believe that what I'm doing is right, that my cake's going to turn out just like hers is. But after all, it's not what's you believe just as long as you're sincere. And so she goes in here and she starts opening the cabinet. And she says, yeah, I believe I will try them two eggs. So she takes some eggs and she busts them and she's opening them and said, there ain't no use wasting that good shell. I just throw that in there too. And she throws this eggshell in there and then she opens the cabinet and starts dumping things in there and she gets a little vanilla flavoring. She dumps some sugar, some salt, some pepper. She puts some, she opens up the cabinet. There's some uh, A1 sauce. There's some Heinz 57 Tabasco. She opens all this stuff and just starts dumping it in there. Why, well, a little bit of that would be good. A little bit of that would be good. A little bit of that would be good. And then she starts looking at other parts of the kitchen. And she opens the refrigerator and gets out, squeezes, a, 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 a cuts up an onion, cuts up a... Uh, a lemon, a, red, a green pepper, a red pepper, puts it all in there, mixes it all up. She said, now what else? I bet this thing going to be tasty. And she opens the trash can. That's another part of your kitchen. Looks in there and gets out some old banana peelings, got coffee grounds all hanging all over them. Drops them in there and get the baby diaper and rings it out, squeezes it over there. And brother just has that thing and then just begin to mix it. And she mixes 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 and she mixes. And she mixes. And she said, I'm going to put it in the oven, dump that thing in there. Brother, you get that thing out, she gets, puts rocks in it. I mean, pencils and t- the re- uh, paper, everything else. Now, if you made a cake like that, it may turn out to look pretty good. Uh, but I tell you what, ma'am, when I come home and she cut me a piece of that stuff, uh, you know how you, have you men, have your wife ever made you a cake? And honest, you think you're going to the hospital? And, and she's so proud of it. And she's, <laughs> and she's like, oh, you're just going to love it. And you taste that thing, and you're about to die. And, and she said, well, is it good with a knife over you? And you say, yes, darling. And man, you'd, it'd kill you to eat something like that. You'd say, I was just as sincere in my cake as she was in her cake. Why didn't my cake turn out like her cake? Well, anybody knows why. You didn't put the right ingredients in. Now, anybody in this church... Your marriage and your home can be just as good as anybody else's. But you've got to put the right ingredients in or it won't turn out right. How many of you have sat back and you say, oh, I wish me and my husband didn't hate each other. We hate each other's guts. We fuss and fight all the time. And then you look at somebody else and every time you see them, they're smiling. And you think, I'd just love to have a home like they've got. No. Well, listen, brother, it's easy to have. All you've got to do is both of you get down to right with God and, brother, put the right ingredients in the home. If the right ingredients ain't put in, the cake don't turn out right. And if the right ingredients is not in your marriage, your home will be a disaster area and you'll wind up uh, living for the devil and wind up in a divorce court and your kid growing up not knowing who their mom and daddy is and all kinds of crazy things. But I'm telling you this morning, we need some ingredients. Now I'm not going to have time to uh, really uh, spend a lot of time on these, but I'm just going to read them off to you. You put these nine ingredients in your home and stir them up. Both husband and wife pray over them. Put them in God's oven and bake them, brother, and your home is going to be happy. I guarantee it. Number one, the first ingredient that you put to have a happy home is love. Love. Brother, that's the glue that holds the family together is love. Brother, there is little where love is than a house, a great thing, where there's strife and hatred, the Bible said. You know what? These, these bricks out here on the side of the side of this paneling, they, them bricks, you know what hold them bricks up? Mortar. There's mortar in between them bricks. And if it wasn't for that mortar, brother, so wind could come along or somebody could push in that whole wall would fall. Mortar holds them together. It's glue. Now that's what love is. Your home is held together by 
I love. And you got mama and daddy and the kids. And if there's enough love in there, the devil may blow and your home can't break up like it should, like the devil would like for it to, as long as there's love in the home. The Bible said love covers a multitude of sin. You say, well, she said something to me I'll never forgive her for. I'll never forgive it. That's where you need love, see? If you got love in your home, you can forgive and swallow it and forget a lot of things for the sake of God and for the sake of your Christian home. If you ain't got love in your home, the first time he does something you don't like, you'll say, chalk it up. Next time he does something you don't like, you'll say, there's another one. Next time he does something you don't like, you'll start keeping a list of his sins. And every time he does something wrong, it just keeps building and building and building and building. One of these days, you're just going to blow your top. And I hate you. I wish I'd have never married you. Blah, blah, blah. blah. You blankety blank. Good for nothing. So you know what's wrong? The love wasn't there in the home. The love wasn't there like it should be. You know what you ladies ought to do? Men too, I reckon. You ought to make you a list and make that big long list there and say things in my husband that I will overlook and not get mad over. Pick out his ten worst faults and write them down. And every time he commits one of those ten things, just overlook it and forget about it. And love, brother, will cover a multitude of sin. You know what? Some men stay gone on purpose and don't come home. They work overtime and everything else to keep from having to come home. Because as soon as they come home, it ain't nothing but a fuss and, excuse me, a fussing and a fighting all the time. And the joy of a house is love. I'd rather live out in a cabin somewhere and just have bread and soup or to eat and brother just sleep on a on a straw mattress than to live in a big old fancy hundred thousand dollar home. And I'm, I ain't just I ain't just talking. I'm, I mean this. I'd rather have that and be happy with my family than to live in a hundred thousand dollar mansion and with a central air condition and a and a uh, what you call them things. Uh, intercom through the house and a Mercedes in the backyard and a Cadillac in the garage and a butt stove and all kind of things and have fussing and fighting and cussing and screaming and threatening to take each other to court all the time. I tell you, brother, better is little where love is than a home with wrath with there are. Second thing I want us to notice, I, I, could, I could probably preach a whole sermon on all of these nine, but I want to hurry along. Second ingredient you better put in your home is respect. Respect. Why is it that we can respect and give honor and reverence to everybody else except our wife or our husband? Now be real quiet now and listen to what I've got ready to say. I believe this is a conviction of my heart. I believe that about 90% of all problems in homes, especially Christian homes, would be solved immediately if every person would put into practice what I'm getting ready to say. All you've got to do is treat your wife or your husband with as much respect as you give other people's wives Amen. and other people's husbands. That's all you got to do. How is it we can be so nice and sweet to everybody else and smart off and be hateful as the devil to our husband and to our wives? I've given you this illustration before. It illustrates a point. All right, here's a woman, she goes into work on Monday morning, and she's sitting here, you know, and she's typing at the typewriter, and, and here comes Mr. Smith in, her boss man. Mr. Smith comes in, and he says, uh, good morning, Mrs. Jones. Oh, good morning, Mr. Smith. And brother, she sa- he says, uh, Miss Jones, would you mind getting me a cup of coffee? You know what she does? She just turns her typewriter off there, gets up. Yes, sir, Mr. Jones. Comes in there, come, takes him a cup of coffee, takes it in there, and sits it down on his desk. Thank you, Miss Jones. You're welcome. Anything else I can do for you, let me know. And she sits down there and goes back to typing. Boy, you let her come home that evening. And the one she's married to comes in. And she's sitting here, she's ironing or something like that. He comes in and says, Honey, I'm wore out. Honey, would you fix me a cup of coffee? He says, Well, get it yourself, fat lip. I worked all day today, too. What's the matter with you, you lazy bum? If you can get it just as easy as I can get it, fix it yourself. Now, how come you can be so nice to Mr. Jones or Mr. Smith and hateful as a devil to your husband? You say, well, I'm, I eat, I'm getting paid for that. Hey, I kind of wonder about these women that don't do nothing unless they get paid for it. I can't hear you. You know what a woman is that don't do nothing unless she's paid for it. 
I mean, y'all ought to, hey, you say, well, the only reason I do that is because I'm getting paid for it. And my husband, listen, listen, you need to respect your husband. If you can do it for him at work, you ought to be able to do it for your husband at home. Amen. I heard about this girl, little bitty girl one time. She's upstairs playing with some kids. And they says, who is them people downstairs? And she said, they must be mighty important people. Mommy's laughing at all daddy's jokes. I tell you what, brother, most people, most people, you know, I'll give you the illustration before. Here you go. You're in somebody's house. And maybe you're over there to eat. And you, they invite you over and now you sit there. And, you, and here she comes in here and she's got everything fixed up. And she's got the tablecloth out. And about, uh, I don't see why people go so much trouble with about 14 spoons and knives and forks. I some places they'll take me up in Michigan and go somewhere and I'll go to a big fancy house. And they'll sit there and man, there's about four spoons and three or four bowls. And I'll say, what's this for? What's that for? I just bite, take one bite with one, one bite with another, and start picking up all of them. And putting, they say, well, this one for your salad, and this one for your soup, and this one for that, and this one for the other. I just, I just eat and don't worry about it. But anyway, they'll have that thing all fixed up, and here she comes. And she sits there and she got the spaghetti on the table. And the spaghetti just looked like a big pile of worms when it ain't got no sauce on it and sitting there on the table and here she comes with a spaghetti sauce and it's piping hot right off the stove and she comes in there and, and all of a sudden now now remember now you're you're over at the neighbor's house you're over there eating here she comes in here with a spaghetti sauce and trying to make a good impression on you and she trips and when she does the spaghetti goes over and flop right down on your clothes What's the first thing that happened? First thing that happened is, she jumps back and says, Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And she gets a nap and starts trying to wipe you off. You, what do you do? You say, Oh, that's all right. This, this old suit here, it ain't no good. Why, it'll come off in a jiffy. I'll just sit here. Why, well, all, don't think a thing about it. That's fine. To somebody you ain't married to. But oh, my soul. If you want World War Three, brother... You let that same thing happen in your house. You say, Brother Danny, you per- I know it's hard. It's hard. I, I ain't a perfect husband. You, you ask my wife. Brother, you be at home. Really, the root of the problem is, men, we're just selfish. Every man is selfish. Now, you think I preach hard against the women? I preach every man is selfish, basically. And all you think about is their self. You say, what's women's biggest problem? They can't keep their mouth shut. A woman cannot keep her mouth shut. Now, a man, he's selfish. <laughs> That's the biggest problem, brother. That's it. And I'll tell you, uh, you, you got that same thing happening at your house. You're eating supper. And there ain't no company. And your wife comes in. And she's got the spaghetti sauce. And there you sit. And brother, all of a sudden she trips. And over goes the spaghetti sauce. And right on your shirt. Right on your pants. You know what you do? You jump up. Ah, you crazy thing. What you trying to do? Stall me to death. She throws a bowl down. Kicks the table. Uh, and brother says, well, I don't care. You deserved it. She goes to her room and starts crying and bawling and boohooing around there. And, and you say, why not? You clumsy thing. Can't you trip over the flowers in the rug? You, you dummy. Why can't you, why can't you do nothing without making a mess out of it? Now, right there, right there, what you just heard in the past ten minutes will solve more marriage problems for you, if you'll do it, than forty hours at a marriage counselor. Try and find out what's wrong. And I ain't knocking at marriage counselors. They're good and they can help in the right way. What I just told you in the last five minutes, and I ain't even going to charge you $30 a whack for it. I'm telling you, if we'd respect each other, we'd lose about 95% of our fusses and arguments. They just stem because we're not willing to respect one another like we should. Nothing ruins a marriage like that. You, you can't argue. Arguing will get you nowhere. Respect. Next thing I want to say, the third ingredient you got to put in your home, fix in there, you know, boot it up, is trust. You got to trust each other. If you don't trust each other, they say nothing makes a marriage rust like distrust. 
Some men cannot tell their wife anything. They can't trust her. You know, a lot of times, women, they'll get each other and they'll tell their heart, you know, and their secrets and all that stuff. But men, men don't get around each other and tell their heart. They ain't got but one person in the world to tell it to. And that's their wife. And some men can't tell their wife nothing because she goes and blabs it to all the other women. Let me just say, I ain't planning on saying this. Yeah, some of you think I'm just up here preaching about you. But you're, you're nuts. I'd say what I'm going to say whether you're here or not. You, hey, this just come to me just now. Listen, you ladies, you have got no business in the world telling what goes on between you and your husband to the other women in the church. Amen. You ain't got no business running your mouth about stuff like that. Amen. Well, if your husband knew you was up running your mouth about him, he'd probably box your jaws. Yeah. There's some women that everything privately, I mean, and I mean, brother, they get down to the nitty gritty. And they go blab about it. All the other women in church, what their husband this and that and that. You know what? When the other women in church see that man, that's all they can think about. You got to keep your mouth shut about your husband's private affairs. It ain't none of no other woman's business. You know, three ways to get word around town. Telegraph, telephone, tell a woman. Amen? They said one picture is worth a thousand words, but most women would prefer the thousand words. I heard about this one guy that died, and somebody said, I heard your daddy died. And he said, yeah, and they said, well, what was his last words? He said, he didn't have none. Mama was with him to the end. Amen. Did you? Boy, you ladies ain't liking that, are you? You wish you'd have put poison in my cake, don't you? I'm telling you, you, you better learn to trust each other. And I'll tell you what, a woman, a man ought to trust his wife, a woman ought to trust her husband. If every time they get out of your sight, when they come home, you have to put them on, in like they're in court, and put them on the stand, Amen. brother, your marriage is in trouble. There's some women that sit at home all day long and watch them ignorant, ungodly, pornographic soap operas. And her mind is filled with doubt and adultery and fornication and liquor all day long. And when her husband comes home, they put him on the stand and say, Where were you today? Did you speak to her? Well, what did you say? What did she say? How long did you talk to her? Blah, blah, blah. What else did you go? What, did she, what else did she say? What else did she say? What else did she say? Uh, you Listen, you'll make him to where he hates to come home if you make him live like that. You've got to trust him. You say, well, Brother Danny, I can't. You can! You say, well, he's run around on me before. Forget it and trust him! Have you ever messed up? Huh? Same thing goes with you, husband. Don't put your wife on the witness stand when she comes home and start running her through the meal like she's being tried in a court of law. If they're running around on you, they probably ain't going to tell you no way. You ain't going to get the truth. You might as well just save them from lying and, and trust them and God will bless them. They'll get to feeling guilty and do what you want them to. Trust. Gossip. Running your mouth. Fussing. Arguing. You'll never get nothing done like that. I'll tell you, about last Saturday night, I think it was, I've been, I've been really tied up in all these revival meetings and I've been preaching about the last 22, three nights, something like that. And it's hard for me to keep up with all the days and stuff, all the things that's going on. Last Saturday night, I came in at, uh, I guess it was 11 o'clock, 11.30, I don't know what time it was, from Burnsville. That was a night I had the problem and the devil was trying to kill me and everything else. And the next day was my birthday. That was November the 3rd. And I, I came in that night. You know, kind of when my head hung low, revival service is dead at four o'clock. I thought, what am I going to do? I was up and it'd been raining, cold, or bad that night, and I had my coat in, I carried it in, I was about halfway feeling sorry for myself. Boy, I walked in the door. I always try to sneak in at night because all the girls are asleep. And I don't want to wake them up, and I take my coat off, or, and I hang up, I got wet shirts and wet ties and wet, 
vest, and I just hang them all over the living room so they can dry out for the next morning. Got two of them hanging down there right now in the den, drying out. <laughs> First thing you know, brother, you don't even have to hang them up. They just stand up by themselves. I had to sweat in them so many times. Almost, Will. You know, I came in that night, and I, and I heard somebody say, Surprise! And I looked around, and there stood Carrie, and there stood Linda, and the other one was conked out. And brother, they had balloons up all over the kitchen, all over the walls, had a cake there, and the candles lit, and all the lights was off, and all you could see is the candle, and had a present laying down. And I tell you what, man, that done something to my soul. I mean, it's, I mean, if she'd have bought me a Cadillac, it wouldn't have done me no more good. They just know they stayed up and waited on me on Saturday night. Now, I'm not a person that really expresses my emotion. I didn't just go in there and go wild and start crying and everything. But I wanted to. And I'll tell you what, that, nothing, there ain't nothing in the world or help make your home a happy home like doing stuff like that for each other. You say, I ain't got the money to go out and buy. Hey, man, you can afford a bag of balloons. <laughs> Surely, if you can't, well... What to be made out of is love and respect and trust for each other. She didn't say, where you been? How many girls do you talk to at church? I know you're out running around on me, Danny Castle. You ain't been to revival. No. Listen, brother, they just had me a little part of that. I, man, I wouldn't run around on her for nothing. I'd just treat me like that. I wouldn't anyway, but... Especially after the, listen, if somebody's good to you and wins you by their love, that'll hold your home together better than anything. You say, well, you don't know what they've done to me. What does the Bible say? Don't return evil for evil, but overcome evil with good. If your mate's being mean to you, the best thing in the world to do for them, do something nice for them. Extra special. They'll feel like a dog. And get around, they'll start treating you right. Yesterday. I've been up here all day long. I tell you, I'll be, I'll be honest with you, I'm human. And I kind of got mad at you men yesterday. If you hadn't had that party yesterday, son, we'd have had a terrible time today. They're supposed to come up here and work, and not one cotton pig in one of them come. Not one. I was the only one. Brother, Dale, uh, brother, brother Steve Justin, Brother Ricky, and Dale Cable... And Jack, after they've done their bus route and street preaching, come up and done the work. Jack is out here sowing grass at 11 o'clock last night. Or he come back to work on it. He's out here sowing at about 6. And he went home, took a shower, and come back, put the stakes up. And, of course, I found out later, you know, what all was going on, where the men was, and work, and all that stuff. But anyway, we left here about, about 3.30, I guess. And I was supposed to leave at 4.30 to meet the preacher over there in Iceville for supper yesterday evening before church. And as we're going home, I said, I ain't got but an hour. I've got to get home. I've got to study. I've got to pray. I don't know what I'm preaching on tonight. I'm just driving me crazy. I had pressure all day long. I've been up late Friday night and early yesterday morning. I thought, oh, Lord, I'm going crazy. What am I going to do? And she said, we got to go down to Nebo and pick up Carrie because Linda Houts keeping Carrie down there and we got to go pick her up. And my flesh said, no, I don't want to. I said, I'll just go on home. You go pick her up. You know what she done? She said, well, I guess we could. That's all. She's getting smart, you know what? She's getting smart. Now, used to, she'd fuss at me. She'd say, well, I think y'all too. And that just make me not want to that much more. Ladies, whatever you want your husbands not do, just fuss at them, and they'll do the opposite. There's just something inside of a man, he's so stubborn, that he just won't do or what a woman fusses at him to do. He just don't want to do it. And the more she fussed at it, the more it makes you made up your mind you ain't going to do it. That's all she said. She said, well, okay. On the way down there, the Lord said, you sorry, good for nothing thing. And I said, but Lord, i got to study and I'm sleepy and I'm tired. You ought to be ashamed of yourself. Here she is with a little baby. You're going to make her drive. Oh, oh, you sorry thing. You can run up and down that parking lot. You can talk to people at the church. You can, you can take time for a phone call, but you ain't got time to run your wife down five minutes down the road and back. I said, okay, Lord, I'll go. And that was the party. I didn't know he was going down there for the party. If I hadn't let the Lord deal with me, I'd have missed the party. <laughs> Man, bro, I, I was going down there and I said, 
Okay, I'll go. And I pulled up down there. We was going to just pick Carrie up. And I seen everybody's car. And I thought, what in the world is going on here? And I recognized Dickie Jarrett's car. I said, that's D- Diane and Dickie's car. What are they doing here? And I, I, and all of a sudden, it just hit me what was going on. And, and I just thought, boy, you know what? If a man will trust the Lord and let the Lord convict him, he'll treat his wife right. When you start backsliding is when you start being hateful and mean to your wife. And I want to say it here tonight, this morning, if there's a man in this church, you can like it or lump it. If you're hateful to your wife, smarting off to her all the time. Now, I know sometimes they accuse you of being hateful when you ain't. But if you really are hateful to your wife, you are not right with God. Bible said, husband, love your wives as Christ loved the church. Christ is firm with the church. Christ is straight with the church. Christ, Christ is, is uh, strong with the church and rebukes the church. But He's not a, a, he ain't a bitch at the church. And He don't mistreat the church as Christ loved the church. That's how you love your wife. Anytime something comes up in your home you want to know how to treat your wife, look in the Bible. Ever how Christ does the church, that's how you do your wife. Amen. Trust. Well, let me move on right quickly. I'll never get all these ingredients in. Number four, family altar. Number four, a family altar. I don't believe a home can be what it ought to be unless there's a family altar in that home. That means a time when daddy, 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 I did say daddy. When daddy gathers the family around and he said we're going to get down and pray and read the Bible. Some of you men here this morning... You are going to be ashamed of yourself one of these days because you are too cotton picking and proud to get down with your family and read the Bible and pray with your family. And you say, get the youngins and pray with them before they go to sleep. And you sit in there and watch the boob tube and won't even pray with your family before they go to bed. One of these days when your kids grow up, they're going to look back and they're going to say, I remember my daddy getting down with us and praying with us and reading the Bible. It'll mean... Or, one of these days when your kids grow up, they're going to say, I never remember my daddy praying with us. Family altar is very important. You know why? You know what mom and dad does nowadays? They sit up and watch the boob tube and say, all right, Johnny, go to bed because something wicked's getting ready to come on. And they don't want him to tell everybody they watch it. And they say, you go on to bed. And he goes on to bed and they say, don't forget to say your prayers neither. That's some family altar, man, I tell you. <laughs> and I know most of you is guilty. And that's the reason I'm preaching, because you need it and it'll help you. You cannot have a happy home without having the right kind of family altar. You say, I don't know how to have family altar. Well, it's time you find out, don't you think? If you sit around and watch TV all the time, you'll be as dumb as a doorknob. Because it does all your thinking for you. You don't even have to think. But if you get that Bible down, and you'll say, Now look here, boys and girls. Look here, Johnny. Look here, Susie. For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son. And that's us. He loved us. And now let's pray. Dear God, thank You for loving us. And You say, Well, oh, I ain't going to... I'm a grown man, preacher. Yeah, you sure are. And you're full of pride. And God can't bless you. You know why? Because you're too stubborn to do what God wants you to do. It's not a sign of a sissy. It's not a sign of being weak for a man to get down on his knees and pray with his family. That's a sign of a real man. That's what Jesus did. He'd pray with those little kids. He had family altar. Another thing it'll do is keep you and your wife from going to bed mad at each other. And if, Because if you go to bed mad at each other, you can't sleep that night. You ever had a big fuss right before you went to bed? And all night long you just... And you was pulling each other's hair out in your dreams. And you was arguing. <laughs> Have you ever done that? Anybody in here ever gets to bed and you oh, I hate you! What? And I believe, that's what I've told you before, I believe the devil must have invented them big king-sized beds. Now, I mean, she'll be laying 40 foot over there facing that wall. And you'll be laying 40 foot over here facing that wall. You say, shut Oh, I go jump in the lake. Oh, good night. Go to sleep. And you'll go to sleep. I, I mean, I got one, but I tell you what, brother, them things, the devil can use them things in a fuss. Way back years ago, and he didn't have a little bitty bed about that wide, you had to get right with each other before you went to sleep. <laughs> you didn't have no choice. And I tell you, uh, uh, back in the old days, you know, people, the kids, you ever slept with your brothers and sisters? You know what makes me madder than anything? They put them. I'm fixing to tell you. 
When they put in the winter time, they'll put them cold, icy, bird toes on me. I can't stand that. I'll be laying there trying to go to sleep, and about that time, my wife feel like a big snake come over there. Put that cold foot toe on my man. I can't stand that. Let me put my toes on you to get them warm. I can't stand that. I tell you, brother, I, I, that's grounds for divorce, man. When you start that stuff. Amen. Family older. Keep you from going to bed mad. Yeah, I heard told you about that guy. I always think of that one. Right about that guy that he went to bed real hungry and he dreamed he ate a 150-pound marshmallow. He woke up and his pillow was gone. <laughs> That's like that guy, thought, you know, he thought he was in Vietnam, you know, and he's going down through there and him and his wife had had a big fuss before he went to bed and he, he's in front and he's sleeping and turning and having nightmares and then he's going up there and he thought he's in Vietnam throwing hand grenades. And he reached down in a thicket and pulled one out throwing... Boom! And he reached in another old thicket and jerked one out and thought, Boom! And done about two or three like that. And, and he heard somebody screaming. And his wife, his, his wife going, Ah! She didn't have a curler in her head. <laughs> but I'm telling you, if you'll get down and pray with each other before you go to bed at night, if you'll get down there and say, Oh dear God, bless our family. Listen, you know what a lot of people do? They get mad and have a big argument and they just skip family altar. You know why? Because the devil says, You hypocrite. You can't have family altar. Brother, you ain't a hypocrite. Get down there and say, Dear God, forgive us for fussing. Forgive us for not doing what we ought to do. And hug and kiss and send the babies to bed, brother, and go to sleep. And you can get you a good night's sleep. I'm going to just have to read the rest of these off, I reckon. You put them in your, you put them in your home and it'll be happy. We could, I guess, continue this tonight, but I've got something else in on my heart. Number five is discipline. You gotta discipline yourself, and you gotta discipline them kids. Now, I'm gonna feel guilty when I say this, cause I got a mess at home right now. By the grace of God, I'm gonna clean it up. I mean it. A man ought to pick up after himself. I believe that. I don't believe it's asking too much for you men to pick your socks up out of the floor. Really, now, I don't believe that'd kill you if you'd done that. There's some men that never did do it at home, and they steal babies. They come in, throw their socks off, shoes off, right in the living room floor, and sack out over here on the couch, get up and go leave their clothes piled up right there on the floor. I don't believe it hurts you big, strong men to hang your clothes up. Put your shoes away. Put your socks in the dirty clothes. I mean, that ain't going to kill you. Discipline. And you better discipline them kids too. Amen? Another thing is work. Kids need a job to do. Take out the trash. Wash the dishes. Cook. Boys help dad. Girls help mom. We're living in a... In a, in a when men are getting more effeminate and men, women are getting more... Uh, Masculine. Weird things happening nowadays. Boys got earrings in their ears. Girls look like wrestlers. They're weird. They're funny looking nowadays. You ever noticed that? Man, I don't know what's happening to people. They're going nuts. I heard about this one little boy. He's telling another little boy. He said, my daddy can beat up your daddy. He said, so what? Mama can beat him up too. <laughs> You seen that cartoon where this woman's down like that with a broom, getting under the bed? She says, "Come out there and fight like a man." That's a day we're living in. Brother. That preacher said one night. They said, "A man that says he's the boss at his house will lie about other things." Do you know that? Discipline, work. Not only that, enjoyment. There has got to be some time when you have some enjoyment. Here again. I'm under conviction. I've been going seven days a week for a long time, many, many months. But I do try to make it up in the morning some and spend the morning. My wife, my kids, by the grace of God, during the holidays, I'm going to make up for that. But I tell you what, friend, you watch a man that can't have no enjoyment with his family, see? All his enjoyment's with the boys. 
Him and his wife ain't never do nothing together. Go nowhere together. he got to get out with his friends. she got to get out with her friends. Then they just come back and live under the same roof. It'll never work like that. It'll never work. You've got to have something that you enjoy together. And it can't be one-sided. I don't know about these men. They'll, they'll, they'll say, well, I do all kinds of things with my wife. I take her fishing. Boy, I bet she enjoys that. Make her sit out there on, a, on an old tin can all night long. Bunch of old worms and mosquitoes biting her. Oh, what a blessing. How good you are to your wife. Now, I know some women like that. A lot of them don't. And I've said it before. If you, if, if you take her fishing on Friday night, the next Friday night, you ought to go to the mall with her and walk around with her. Uh, that's sickening, ain't it? That's as, that's as bad as the, 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 the plagues in the tribulation. Going to a mall and having to walk around. Them is these sickness. Demon infested joints. I have seen in my life. Now, I can walk in a mall and I can feel the devil, brother. But now, the women, they, they, they say they don't. I don't know if they do or not. Say they don't. They can walk around in that. And I could walk around out in the woods or out in the yard here. For 14 hours and not get as tired as walking around in a mall for a one hour. It ain't something about it. It kills you. You go in one store, there's some, there you go, buy that one right there. That's a good one. No, I want to look around a little bit. <laughs> go over here to the next store, they got the very same one. It might be 10 cents cheaper. I said, I'll go ahead and buy that. I'd rather pay $2 more for it and go ahead and buy it and get it over with you. They only look at another store, and then look at another store, and then look at another store, and then look at another store. And after you look at so much, none of it don't look good. That's why they say, I went and looked all day and couldn't find nothing. You know why? When you first look at it, it looks good. You go looking at cars. When you go to buy a car, you go looking at cars, and when you first see them, they look good. You look at them all day long, none of them looks good. That's right. I'm telling you, brother, there's got to be some time for enjoyment. So you men just bite your tongue and go over and buy some peanuts or something and walk around in the room and just do a little kiss. And right, leave some tracks laying around. And boy, she'll really think you love her. You ought to have some enjoyment together. Well, let me say right quickly, number eight, devotion. You're going to have to devote yourself to each other and to the Lord. You as a husband are going to have to devote yourself to your wife. If you've got to make it. You as a wife are going to have to devote yourself to your husband. You can't be... You can't be looking for a place to get out. Have you ever seen a, a horse or a cow and they're in the fence and they just go up and down the fence looking for a place to get out? That's the way some people live their married life. They're constantly looking for a way out, a way out, a way of escape. Here's my way I can get out. I got him this time. He'll, I, yeah, that way I can divorce him and it'll look like it's his fault. And it, They're constantly looking for a hole in the fence. Then you see another old cow down there and it's just as content enjoying the pasture. I'll tell you something, folks. Just because you're fenced in don't mean you, can, you can't be happy. The grass ain't greener on the other side of the fence. If you broke out of the fence and you went out there and you got you another, you'd find yourself in the very same shape that you're in now before it's over with. Devotion to each other. Then lastly, faith. You're going to need a lot of faith. That all things work together for good to them that love God. That even though you may be in a, quote, impossible situation. I've had people tell me, you don't know my situation. It's impossible. It's too far gone. Our marriage can't be saved. Even though you are in a so-called impossible situation, things can change. Things can be different. Things can. You say, you don't know what all we've done to each other. I don't care. God's able. He's able to fix it up you want to have a happy home, if you'll put these nine ingredients in it, you can. It may take you five years to get it, but God will give you a happy home. There's a lot we could say, but we're going to close. How God loves a Christian home where faith and love attest that every moment, every hour, He is the honored guest. Maybe whole families need to rededicate themselves to each other. And to God. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. 
Every head bowed and every eye closed this morning while our pianist comes to the piano right quickly. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. No talking. Christians praying. Maybe someone here this morning. Say, Brother Danny, I want to be a better husband. I want to be a better wife. We're going to give you a chance to come. Father, do what needs to be done in this invitation. Dear Lord, I know we can, we laugh and cut up about some of these things, but Lord, we know they're serious. God, we know that somebody here this morning, whole future is on the rocks. Some little kids, some little boys, some little girls, unless mom and daddy puts these ingredients in their home, we'll never be able to grow up and lead a normal life. Oh, God, I ask you to do a miracle this morning. By the power of your Spirit, do a miracle. Sweep over this congregation. God, you know the Word's been preached. Now I pray you'd let it find a lodging place. You know where it's needed and how to apply it. And I pray you'd do that this morning. God, help those that need to make commitments to do that this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.